Hello, friends. Welcome to this afternoon's presentation, Bugs and Butterflies in Your Backyard. I'm James Stevenson with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences here in Pinellas County. We're a partnership with the local government, Pinellas County, and we provide research-based information from the university for our citizens on making good choices uh, as stewards of the little bit of land that we have a sphere of influence over. I'm coming to you today from Burker Creek Preserve. We're the largest preserve in Pinellas County, almost 9,000 acres of undeveloped Pinellas County, which is very rare as our county is 98% built out. So we are a refuge for wild Florida. Today's presentation, bugs and butterflies in your backyard. What's that bug? Mm, let's use a science word from now on when we're referring to this group of animals. And I'll explain why later. Today, we'll be exploring the world of insects. And using the word insect, I will again explain a bit later uh, why it's important to use insect. There's a reason that the insects are called what they are. They are made of sections. So the word insect has the same root as section and incision. Uh, can you guess the three main sections of an insect? Well done. The head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The head section is where the eating and the sensory takes place with uh, eyes, antenna, and the mouth parts. The thorax is primarily for locomotion. The thorax is where the legs are attached and the wings as well. And the abdomen is even divided into sections. Uh, the abdomen is where respiration, digestion, and reproduction, those kinds of things take place. So those are the three main sections, but again, divided in further into smaller sections. So we're talking about the insects. Now the insects were the first creatures on earth to take flight. Uh, here we see, this is a beetle. Insects have four wings. They have two fore wings, F-O-R-E wings, and two hind wings. In the beetles, the fore wings are modified, uh, not for flight, but to protect these membranous wings uh, that they use for their powered flight. But insects were the first in the air, and as a result of the insects' arrival on the scene, along with the flowering plants, uh, both have exploded in diversity. And there are more insects than all other animals on Earth. In fact, there are even just more beetles than all other animals on Earth. So it's a huge and diverse group, and certainly well worth getting to know. Now, we don't know exactly what uh, insects see. We don't exactly know how they see. Uh, Hollywood has always treated us to kind of a kaleidoscope effect when, you know, the fly was going after its victim. But we do know that insects do have these compound eyes made of tiny, tiny, tiny little compartments. And as far as not knowing exactly how they see or what they see, we do know that certain insects, and this is a, the face of a praying mantis, uh, they can see in 3D. An experiment was done in the United Kingdom uh, with a praying mantis, and they showed a praying mantis a two-dimensional film of its prey species, something that it would normally want to attack and eat. No reaction. Then they glued a tiny little pair of 3D glasses onto the praying mantis face. They used beeswax, nobody, nothing, no mantis was harmed in this experiment. And when they showed a three-dimensional film to a mantis wearing 3D, itty bitty little tiny 3D glasses, it actually did respond to the images of the prey species on the screen. So they do have a brain and they do have a nervous system and obviously working in consort to help this animal detect its prey. Insects have a wide variety of mouth parts. Uh, there are six pairs of mouth parts in all insects, but they are widely different. The same parts have been modified in the various types of insects for various uh, feeding mechanisms. We have in the, inst in the case of the beetles, uh, some of the beetles, they have their mandibles are modified into chewing mechanism, a chewing mechanism to, to, to you know, masticate whatever it's going to eat. 
the butterflies and the moths, of course, have a siphoning mouth part. It's the same, it's the same mouth part. They're just put together so differently uh, into a siphon that they can actually uh, draw um, nectar out from their nectar sources. Some insects' mouth parts are modified into more of a sponge. In the case of the filth breeding flies, not very attractive moniker, but there you have it, uh, they can actually sponge up salts from uh, fresh um, dung, for example, a good source of uh, recycling salts from dung. Uh, and of course, some insects, what we call bite, they more likely pierce uh, our skin and the skin of anything that they want to draw uh, blood meal from, or uh, not just blood, but other insects will pierce other insects and draw out their um, juice, as it were, and feed on that. So all these are made from the same mouth parts, just modified very differently across different groups of insects. Insects, of course, go through a, a process called metamorphosis, metamorphosis. And I kind of think that the monarch life cycle has been done to death. I think we all know it, but here it is again, just in case you missed it for the past billion times. There was an egg hatched into a caterpillar, caterpillar formed a chrysalis, the chrysalis and so on. And we have an adult that is wildly different from the larva. That is a complete metamorphosis. But some insects go through a more incomplete metamorphosis where the juvenile looks pretty much more or less the same as the adult, only without wings. So that is a less dramatic, uh, less complete metamorphosis. Hope everyone's doing okay. We're gonna carry on. We're gonna do what's that insect. And what we're going to go through now is some of the major group of insects and a little bit about them. Hopefully you'll gain an, an appreciation for the various groups of insects and not get the creepy crawlies. Today's, uh, one, of the, one of the goals from today's presentation is to kind of de-creepy the whole concept of insects and, and illustrate some of their ecological roles and benefits. So the first group we'll look at are the dragonflies. Uh, dragonflies are ancient, ancient, ancient. These are um, these represent some of the earliest of the winged insects. Uh, their scientific name is the odonata, which is Greek for toothy because they have these massive jaws that they use to catch their prey in the air. They're very agile flyers. They can fly forward, backward, and from side to side. Uh, barely even flapping their wings, just vibrating their stiff outstretched wings incredibly fast. Um, obviously, they use their sight to locate and dispatch their prey in the air. Uh, the, in this species, the dragonfly's eyes are so big that they touch and they take up the majority of the head. This is a roseate skimmer, uh, which you can find flying over still water um, in local ponds, freshwater ponds. Now you'll often, if not always, see dragonflies near in proximity to a body of fresh water because they lay their eggs in water and their larvae grow up underwater. Their larvae are referred to as nymphs um, because of their aquatic habitat, aquatic lifestyle. And what do you think dragonfly larvae, what do you think dragonfly nymphs eat? Mm-hmm. They can catch fish. They can catch fish that are about as big as them. And the way that dragonfly nymphs catch their prey is their mouth, their lower jaw actually shoots forward. And if you've seen that movie from the, I don't know, 80s or 90s called Alien, where they had the monster that could, had one mouth and then a second mouth came out and grabbed you, this is where the inspiration for that creature came from. The, the catapult-like jaws of the dragonfly nymph. As adults, they can take down prey uh, larger than themselves. Sometimes they're so heavy, they'll just have to drop to the ground to eat it, but they use those uh, big jaws, those, their big toothy grin that gives the family its name, the odonates, um, to dispatch of their prey. Now, dragonflies need clean water for their young to grow up in. So it's very important that we maintain clean waterways so that we can maintain a good dragonfly population because some of the things that they love to snack on that also live around freshwater are the 
mosquitoes. The next group we'll look at, the crickets. Uh, the grasshoppers and the crickets, actually, you can, you can see slight differences between the two if you can envision a, a grasshopper. They belong to a group called the Orthoptera, which translate to the straight wings. Um, most insects do have straight wings, but this particular group got to get that name. Uh, the crickets are cryptically colored and they have very, very long antenna. They're usually brown and dull. Of course, crickets can chirp. They are one of the singing insects. Uh, they use special um, membranes on their wings. They don't actually rub their legs together. It's actually something that happens in the rings, in the wings. It's kind of like drawing a popsicle stick down a comb. It's that kind of mechanism. They just have a, a natural comb and a natural popsicle stick. In many countries, uh, insects are viewed as a very valuable source of food. And it's something that is becoming a bit more mainstream, uh, even in European and Western, uh, where we're looking at potential food shortages. And there's certainly no shortage of insects uh, in certain cases. We have perhaps heard that a lot of insects are on the brink of extinction. We're having mass extinctions, but insects can actually be raised very quickly and they're a very dense protein source. So think about it. I've heard people have made chocolate chirp cookies out of flour made from ground up crickets. Don't yuck, it could be coming soon to a Publix near you. The grasshoppers also in the orthopterans. And I like this slide, perhaps you've seen one of these very large grasshoppers in your garden. They love to chew on some of the lilies, some of the amaryllis. Uh, this is a lubber grasshopper. And you can see very clearly the head, the thorax with the wings and the legs. And in the back, do you remember the third? Do you know, remember the third section? Head, thorax, and you can talk to yourself. No one's going to hear. Go ahead. Abdomen. Very good. And you can see that this abdomen is actually in sections as well. I wanted to point out these little dots on each of the segments of this lubber grasshopper's abdomen. This is how insects breathe. They breathe through holes in their abdomen. The holes are called spiracles. And of course, they're open to the outside world. And like a bellows, they can inflate and compress their abdomen to draw air in and expel air out. And the air just circulates throughout their body. They do not breathe in through their mouths like we do. They actually have this respiration system. And the way that many garden pests are controlled is by taking advantage of that and closing those holes. So using a product that's not a poison, uh, but rather a soap or an oil that can actually close up those holes would cause anything that's sprayed with that oil or soap to basically suffocate. Uh, indiscriminate. So if you've got your insect spray, your, I'm sorry, your oil or your uh, soap, uh, non-toxic, if you got that on a beneficial insect, the same fate would befall it. It does not know who you're targeting. The grasshoppers can actually change their feeding habits. Grasshoppers are usually solitary eaters. They live by themselves, they eat by themselves, but something triggers grasshoppers to occasionally change that behavior into what's called gregarious feeding, where they swarm and they all feed together as an incredibly huge, hundreds of thousands of members strong. This is the locust. When a, grass, when a species of grasshopper changes its feeding habit from solitary to gregarious, it is then referred to as a swarm or even a plague of locust. And you can imagine this swarm moving across an agricultural area can do a significant amount of damage in a very short period of time. So they're very, very economically important, our grasshoppers and crickets, not just from their potential food source, but as their potential as a serious pest species. Another group that we have are the mantids. Uh, they're often referred to as the praying mantis and their, their name actually means they're prophet-like because they hold their little forearms folded up in front of them as if they were in prayer. Well, they're not, that's not what they're doing. Um, that's just kind of a, a, a trigger mechanism that they use to ensnare their prey. 
This one's got his arms stretched out. I'm sorry, his forelegs stretched out. And you can see the barbs uh, that line the forearms and uh, the, the first little joint there. That's what they use to actually ensnare their prey from a distance. And this one obviously looks very much like a stick. It can sit there looking very much like a stick until an unsuspecting prey species walks by and then waga, these arms come shooting out and ensnare the prey. Here's another one of our native mantids. Uh, this is the grizzled mantid and it's very, very brightly colored. You can see this black and white pattern and the inside of its forearms is bright red, um, just colorful all over. Um, but See if you can spot the grizzled mantis in this slide. Anything? All right, I'll help you out. Here are the eyes. Here are the antenna. Here's the thorax and here's the abdomen. An excellent, excellent camouflage. Uh, this one is camouflaged to appear to be lichen, which is this plant-like organism the subject of an upcoming webinar, in fact, uh, on tree trunks. So again, an unsuspecting prey victim, prey species could walk by just thinking it's walking up to a, a patch of lichen and wham, those forearms come lashing out and ensnare the prey. A very closely related group, in fact, they're thought now to be in the same family are the cockroaches. Uh, the cockroaches are in the blatodia. Uh, blata was the Greek word for roach. I think it's because it's what they wanted to do to them when they saw them, blat them out. Anyway, um, this is our native palmetto bug. Um, you'll note the head, the thorax, and the abdomen here, but the thorax does not have any wings. Our native um, palmetto bug, huge palmetto bug, uh, they're flightless. No wings, can't do it. They just love to kind of mosey around the forest floor, um, up in the palmetto fronds and that sort of thing, eating detritus, eating broken down organic matter. Uh, these are not a pest species. These are a native species, our palmetto bugs. They're large and they're creepy, but they don't get in our houses. Uh, we have some non-native pest species, uh, the American roach, which is African, the Australian roach, which is also African, and the German roach, uh, from Asia, these are pest species that have made themselves quite at home around human habitation. I hate this slide, I wanna get through it rather quickly. I love insects, they can crawl all over me, but I scream. If one of these jumps out of the silverware drawer, I'm gonna scream. Um, as far as how they get these funny names when they come from all these different countries, um, people are mean and they tend to like, in Europe, this animal appeared from Africa and maybe they didn't like Americans, so they called it the American roach. And the same with the Australian roach, maybe whoever it appeared to first didn't like the Australians and obviously somebody didn't like the Germans as well. So they have these funny common names, but it has nothing to do with where they come from. Okay, moving on. This is why we don't refer to insects as bugs, because there is a group of insects that are actually the true bugs, uh, the hemipteras, uh, which means half wing. And like the beetles, one of their wings is not used in flight, uh, the other wing is. So it's, it's kind of, it only uses half of it wings. Simplifying that a little bit, but it's kind of what it means. This is uh, the leaf-footed bug. And on several of the entomology pages that I follow on Facebook, when people see this thing, they take a picture of it and they freak out. It's about an inch, it's harmless, more or less. Um, but the bugs are defined by this diamond shaped body. Uh, they have piercing mouth parts. So they either pierce plants or other, other insects. Um, leaf-footed bug in this instance because the tibia here has these flattened out leaf-like uh, outgrowths. Oftentimes the leaf-footed bugs are seen with only one hind leg. They can actually, if they're attacked by something, they can actually eject a leg 
uh, to avoid predation. And they get along just fine with only the five legs. The stink bugs are in this group. The stink bug has a diamond shaped feature, a sucking mouth part, a piercing mouth part, um, and a stench. And the bed bugs are in this group as well. The bed bugs are a true bug. And of course, they're economically and, and socially very uh, important. Another one is the wheel bug. And this is a side view. It has this raised carapace on its um, thorax here that has spikes on it. You can see the modified mouth parts are kind of like a dagger that it keeps tucked up under itself until it spies a prey victim. And then it uses that very strong dagger uh, to pierce the tough exoskeleton of, in this case, a beetle. And uh, insects' abdomens are full of all their reproductive and digestive and respiratory tissues, um, all kind of floating around in a supportive goo. And all those things can be slurped up using this piercing uh, mouth part of the true bugs. Related to the true bugs as well are the cicadas. Now these used to be in a separate family, but science and technology has determined that the cicadas belong in the same hemiptera group as the true bugs, although they do have all four wings modified for flight. And cicadas are very powerful flyers and they are the loudest animals on earth. And they're just beginning to make their seasonal breeding noises. Um, again, they have, um, they're one of the singing insects. Uh, these are more like if you have a coffee can that's empty. Do y'all remember coffee cans, the metal coffee cans? Okay, if you have a coffee can that's metal um, and you turn it over on its end, you can push the metal in and out on the bottom and make a little wacka wacka sound. Um, there's a biological equivalent to that um, in the cicada's makeup that allows it to make that very, very loud noise. It's called a tympanum, actually. Um, the more or less incomplete metamorphosis, uh, the, meta the cicada lives underground for years. It can be up to 17 years, depending on the species, as something looks very much like a grub feeding on tree roots, uh, not to any devastation, of course. They wouldn't want to uh, kill the tree that they're feeding off of. Uh, but, a, but then they kind of pupate and emerge from the ground uh, as what's called a crawler. And the reason that they have this phase is this crawler is completely encased and armored in this exoskeleton, this chitinous exoskeleton. That way, if the metamorphosis had taken place completely underground, upon crawling up through the ground, through the soil, the wings could be damaged. So this is kind of his travel outfit. And then once uh, raised up above the surface of the soil, the adult can emerge and engorge its wings with the hemolymph, the, the insect equivalent of blood, uh, to inflate them into their uh, stiff flight wings. So those are the cicadas. Um, most cicadas don't feed. They only, they only feed, okay, they feed when they're larvae. The adults don't feed. You can see oftentimes their mouth parts are just invisible. Um, anybody know what this is? You remember these? These are the antlion depressions. These are often found under eaves where the rain doesn't uh, mess up the surface of the soil. Uh, they are pits. Um, these are traps, in fact. And at the bottom of each one of these pits lies an ant lion. It's called an ant lion because uh, if an ant or any other small insect, uh, crawling insect, were to be stumbling across the sand, they could slip and fall into the trap, maybe not fall all the way down, but in trying to escape, in, in trying to crawl up out of the trap, uh, grains of sand are kicked all the way down to the bottom, and that gives the creature at the bottom of the pit um, warning that there is something in its trap. So it begins to toss sand in the direction of whatever that thing is that's in their trap. Eventually, the creature will fall down to the bottom, and at the bottom of the pit is this, the lion itself, the ant lion, with these huge, powerful, toothed jaws 
that it uses to pull the prey underground, and then smaller mouth parts that it uses to masticate and eat up whatever was uh, ill-fated enough to fall into that pit. You'll notice, and I love this slide because it allows us to explore how insects sense the external, the exterior world. Um, they often use hairs. These hairs are incredibly sensitive to the slightest vibration so that they can tell the direction of the sand that might be falling down into the traps. No real need for antenna here um, living underground because it's not going to pick up very many signals other than uh, sand falling down into the pit. But living at the bottom of a pit by yourself um, is kind of a lonely existence and certainly no way to find a mate. Uh, so eventually uh, this larva of the ant lion pupates and emerges as the adult. And again, a very complete metamorphosis, looking not much like the larva at all. Uh, the ant lion, now referred to um, as a neuropterin, which means nerve wing, and you can see the wings of the adult are netted like a nervous system. They could be mistaken for a dragonfly because they have these long, stiff, clear wings and with clearly visible uh, veins, but remember dragonflies hold their wings horizontally away from their bottom and the ant lion adults do not. And here you can see uh, the antenna that most insects sport in some phase of their life. Uh, the antenna are very sensitive to things like temperature. Um, they can pick up chemical signals. They can pick up scents. They can pick up hormones from members of their species or another species. And here, of course, the adult has a very well-developed eye that was not necessary when the larva was living underground. Our next group is the largest group of insects. If you ever get bored, start studying beetles. You'll be doing it for the rest of forever. Um, you can see a huge variety in shapes and sizes and colors, but all beetles are based on the same basic outline. They're called the coleopterans because they have the modified forewings that protect the hind wings, uh, huge diversity in feeding habits, um, they're all over the world. There are, that we know of, 280,000 different species of beetles. That's more than all other animals lumped together. All other species of all the whale species and all the bear species and all the bird species, all that lumped together still can't outnumber beetles. And we're still discovering more every day. Um, some are actually endangered. Uh, guess why this one's endangered? Yes, people want to have it in their collection because it's pretty. Uh, they are, as, I ref as I mentioned before, the coleoptera means protected wing. So they have this, um, the forewing is modified to protect the hind wing. Maybe the spokes beetle, uh, everybody's favorite beetle, the lady beetle. You'll find lady beetles um, my boss showed me one of her little seven months old uh, building block, had a lady beetle on it. Um, you see this motif everywhere. We know that, or most people know that these are uh, beneficial garden insect because they feed on aphids. Um, so this is a very shiny, clean, wonderful, you know, put it on your kid's notebook, lady beetle. But spare a thought for the dung beetle, the lowly dung beetle who's, you know, Got a pretty dirty job, but it's very, very good at it. Dung beetles use their antenna to detect fresh dung, and dung is usually referred to as the excrement of an herbivore. So horses, cows, elephants, and so on, the dung beetles are attracted to that. They break off little bits and roll them across the landscape backwards. So here's this dirty dung beetle pushing a ball of dung across the landscape, that is an incredibly important ecological service. If you think about when you put manure in your garden, what a benefit that is to all the plants that you're trying to grow. So the dung beetles, they basically do the same thing. They, they spread manure and bury it uh, for the, not for the plants, but as a benefit to the plant species. It adds nutrition for them. Now, why do dung beetles want dung? Well, 
they lay their eggs in dung. And the larvae, when they emerge, when they hatch, um, they feed on the dung, you know, nothing goes wasted. So incredibly important ecological service. The Egyptians, the dung beetle was sacred. You might have heard the scarab beetles. The scarab beetles are the dung beetles. Um, and the Egyptians believed that the sun was a big ball of dung and a giant holy sacred dung beetle pushed it across the sky every day. So that's, the Egyptians were onto something. Our next group are the flies and they are called the dipterans, D-I-P-T-E-R-A, which means two wings. And here's a view from the side of, you can see the big compound eye, so you can tell that this fly is using its vision to find whatever it's looking for. This is one of the ones that has that spongy uh, mouth part that it uses to dab up salts off of uh, fresh fecal material. Uh, here you can see the two wings. Now they actually, did, they did start out with four wings, but I'll show you what happens to the, the other two wings in just a second. Short antenna, I, like I said, most of their um, information comes from their vision and from their very, very hairy bodies. Love bugs are a type of fly, and love bugs were not an invention of the University of Florida. Um, they are an invasive species. They have entered Florida in living memory, uh, but they came in I want to say naturally, but it's not natural. They came in because of our highway system. And as highway systems became more and more uh, complex uh, and with their grassy medians and verges, uh, love bugs were able to come into the country from Central and South America and spread throughout the Southeast. Um, they lay their eggs in cut grass. So all those grassy margins and verges among the highways are where the love bugs are concentrated. And thus, they're concentrated around our cars, and thus, they cover our cars in love bug juice uh, when we drive through a swarm of them. Male love bugs are smaller and stockier in stature, and they have very, very good eyesight. I mean, look, their eyes are touching just like our dragonflies early on. The female, she can barely see. She's just cargo, man. She just gets carried around by the male. He's looking for a nectar source. He's looking for tiny little flowers so that he can land on that flower and they can both get a meal. Uh, they stay connected throughout their entire lives. The female is mostly made of ovary. So she's mostly an egg laying machine. So, I mean, she can, when she emerges, she can kind of tell where she is, but the male spots her, they attach, and fly off to make more love bugs. Perhaps the most important fly, the most dangerous, I'm, I mean the most deadly animal on earth is a fly, and it's the mosquito. And of course we know that mosquitoes carry a host of diseases and they use, in this case, their piercing mouth part to draw blood. The females only draw blood that they use for their eggs to develop. Um, they don't feed on blood, they feed their eggs with blood. And the male mosquito um, does not bite um, and they are actually nectivorous as are some female adult mosquitoes that they actually feed on nectar. And some male mosquitoes are actually important pollinators. So completely eradicating a mosquito species could have negative effects um, but of course, from a public health perspective, uh, we do certainly need to do battle with mosquitoes. And I hope I don't need to remind you how to reduce mosquitoes around the house by eliminating standing water and so on. Um, encouraging fresh water systems that have lots of uh, healthy gambusia, the, the fish, um, a healthy water system to support a healthy population of dragonflies and so on. The crane fly, sometimes called a mosquito hawk, and here is a good example of what happens to the, the, four, the hind wings of the flies, the true flies. They're modified into these two little drumsticks. These drumsticks are called halters, and they're kind of counterweights that help uh, these insects, the flies, the dipterans, fly around. So even though they're called only, they're called only two wings, uh, the hind wings are just modified. And the crane flies, again, 
uh, they're not particularly carnivorous. They're not particularly, um, they're not gonna bite you. They look like giant mosquitoes and of course they're related, but uh, most crane flies either don't feed at all as an adult, they, they only reproduce as an adult or occasionally nectivorous. And we all know what these are, moving on to this group. Yes, it's another kind of fly. These are the bee flies. These are bee mimics. These are flies that have developed to look like bees. And why would you want to look like a bee? Because bees sting, right? So these are actually flower flies. They visit flowers just like bees do. They draw nectar just like bees do. Uh, but they are bee mimics for their own protection. Here's one we call Darth Vader. This is one of the horse flies or the deer flies. Um, huge, inch long, black deer fly. Uh, big eyes that it uses to search out mammals. This group of the deer and, and horse flies, they also use uh, vertebrate blood to feed their, to develop their eggs. You can't apply anything to your skin that's going to keep this thing from seeing you with these eyeballs. So these you can kind of outrun. Uh, thankfully, they're not too numerous throughout the year. They kind of come in waves, um, but certainly something to be cognizant of when you're walking in a natural area. Now we're going to move on to my favorite group, um, the Lepidopterans, the scaly wings. And within the Lepidopterans, there are two separate groups. There's one group that's referred to as the butterflies, which we'll discuss later. And there's another group that's referred to as the moths. And there are differences between butterflies and moths. Um, generally speaking, the moths are active at night. Generally speaking, the moths have very feathery antenna as opposed to more stick-like in the, in the butterflies. Generally speaking, the moths have a much fatter body much, and a much furrier, if you will, uh, much more hairs and scales on their short, fat bodies. And I love the moths. I, I think I like moths more than I like butterflies, but that's just me. This is one of our largest native moths, the Luna moth. Uh, Lepidoptera, the moths and butterflies, uh, that means scaly wings. And if you've ever had the chance to need to maybe escort a moth or a butterfly out of an enclosed space, you might have noticed that that dust that comes off on your fingers, that's the millions and millions and millions of microscopic scales that are on the wings of the moths and the butterflies. Probably an adaptation to help them escape from spider webs. Um, their, their scales can fall off in the spider web and the moth and butterfly can escape. Luna moth, huge, big as your hand, pale green, uh, eye spots, which we'll cover a little bit later, and these wonderful little uh, swallowtail extensions on their hind wings. Another one of our large and colorful moths is the imperial moth. Uh, brightly colored, red and yellow, the males more red than yellow, the females more yellow than red. Again, this one's probably three inches across from wingtip to wingtip. The EO moth, um, this one has a caterpillar that can sting the heck out of you. Um, it's covered in tiny little spines. You can actually see the spines. We recommend not ever touching anything with spines so you don't have to find out if it's gonna sting you or not. Um, that's the EO moth caterpillar. The adult uh, does not have any defense, no stingy defense, so what it does is it tries to fool you. Um, if, a, if an eel moth at rest is disturbed, it reveals these giant, these are called eye spots. Um, and this moth is trying to pretend to be an owl. So anything that messed with it, if it's, if it's smaller than an owl, would see those eye spots and, and hightail it, hopefully, for the eel moth. Another of our native moths with these dramatic eye spots is the polyphemus moth. Um, and there are some species of the polyphemus moths where the forewings are actually modified to look like snake heads. So these things are really, really clever with the eye spots and the fake snake, you know, just trying to, just trying to survive. Uh, another moth I have to add, um, this was actually on, uh, this one flew up to my back door one evening and I thought it was a bat, it was big. And so I snuck up on it 
And it turns out it's a, uh, a, one of our large moths called a black witch moth. And again, it's got some eye spots. It's trying to make me go away because it wants me to think that it's an owl. Interesting species of moth. Okay, I'll just one more. Um, this is the banded sphinx moth. And the sphinx moths are very, very designer moths. They have all kind of wonderful patternings and colors. Uh, their caterpillars are the hornworms. And hornworms uh, can be important agricultural pests, even if it's just your own little tomato patch. Uh, but look what those caterpillars are going to turn into. And we have to uh, put a little plug in for save the caterpillars, uh, maybe tolerate caterpillars in your sphere of influence, maybe not try and kill all the caterpillars because many of them will turn into these wonderful, wonderful moths and of course the butterflies. Our next group are the hymenopteras, which means the membrane winged. And of course, these would be the quote unquote stinging insects. These are the ones that are modified. They have body, they have body parts that are oftentimes modified into um, needles, like hypodermic needles that can inject a venom into whatever it wants to envenomate for whatever reason. Honeybees, hornets, fire ants, yellow jackets, wasps, that sort of thing. I'm gonna tell you about the, what's it called, the murder hornet in just a second. We will cover that and I will send you more information, but I do wanna give you a little bit of science. Um, well, let's just go ahead and do that now. Uh, this. If you haven't heard, there's, a, there's some stuff going on in social media and actually in uh, the news, CNN, Fox, all the networks, all the network news, New York Times, all that, all that routine about uh, North America being invaded by murder hornets. Um, there is a species of Asian hornet that gets to be about the size of your thumb. It's in the genus Vespa. Um, there is we do have an established non-native Vespa in the East Coast, and it doesn't kill people. Uh, this very large and imposing um, Vespa, this murder hornet, um, was just um, four individuals were spotted in British Columbia last year. Four individuals were discovered in British Columbia last year. A nest was also identified and destroyed. Not far from that nest, a dead adult drone worker uh, was found on the Washington State side of the border with Canada. Therefore, the murder hornet has been discovered in the United States. One possible hive was attacked in Washington, but we don't have all the data yet. Of course, the entomologists are excited. Um, of course, the entomologists are on alert. Of course, the entomologists are going to do a lot of testing, trapping. Um, this will require some funding. So hopefully we can find some funding for this because of course we do not want another invasive species, especially one that can strike fear into people the way that um, our news outlets have so much enjoyed doing this past couple of days. They are a stinging insect. Um, people have died from their stings, mostly those people who are already allergic to um, the hymenopteran stings or any other stings. Uh, just one sting from a honeybee could to take out could take out someone who's particularly sensitive. Um, others in certain years uh, have been stung multiple times, so it's certainly not something that we want to um, encourage by any stretch of the imagination, and it's certainly something to be watching for, but it's not an invasion of the body snatchers right now, and we'll just let the entomologists do their work. They're monitoring, they're waiting, they're watching, and they know exactly what they're doing. So. Hair is not on fire right now. Here is a very arguably sweet hymenopteran. This is the mud dauber. She's solitary. She flies around by herself, she, no hives, 
no, you know, underground hives or anything scary like that. She lives by herself. Uh, she flies around. She gets a, a wad of, of mud and she takes it to the eaves of a house. The mud daubers are sometimes called the wasp wasted thread, sorry, the thread wasted wasps. She takes her little mouthful of mud and takes it to the eaves where it can dry nicely into kind of an adobe material. She makes a little chamber, a little apartment, uh, and then goes out in search of her prey, uh, which might be spiders or caterpillars. Um, she uses her stinger to envenomate the spider or and or the caterpillar uh, just to paralyze them. It doesn't kill them, it just paralyzes them. Then she stuffs this little apartment with um, paralyzed spiders and or caterpillars and lays an egg. Seals off that chamber and then goes off and tries and to, to find more mud to make the next chamber and so on 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 and so on. And, so on and, so on and, and as her daughters emerge, they might go out and help her continue to make these uh, chambers, or they might go out uh, and start some chambers of their own. But if you think that each one of these are made of a single little mouthful of, of mud that this mud dauber has collected, it's pretty impressive over one season what these can do, all by herself. It's the communal, it's the eusocial, E-U social, the truly social hymenopterans, bees and wasps, that you have to be careful of because they will defend their hive and how. And they use their stingers uh, to not only uh, dispatch their prey, but to defend their hive. And the paper wasps, uh, they can, using their mouth parts, and, and this queen has, raised up all of these daughters and they're all helping her increase the size of this uh, paper wasp colony. Um, they feed the, the young, the grubs, some kind of chewed up caterpillars, that sort of thing. Um, many wasps are also nectivorous. They might feed their young nectar uh, there and so on. You can see the, the cap of this particular chamber. This one's just about to emerge to add one more to the colony and so on. So. These, these girls will defend their paper wasp colony. Of course, the honeybee is a eusocial. We know that honeybees form colonies that we have um, taken advantage of. We can move the colonies around. We've bred uh, honeybees to be very docile and not so defensive around their hives, but as docile as we've made them, of course, the beekeepers still have to get dressed up in that funny suit because um, they will defend their honey. I mean, it's there for them. It's not there for us. The honeybee is not one of our native bees. We have plenty, plenty, plenty of native bees, wasps. They're excellent pollinators. The honeybee has just established itself. It's not an invasive species, but it's certainly not a native species. Um, honeybees, of course, are under all kinds of pressures. Uh, we have kind of um, unnaturally increased the numbers of individuals on earth through our efforts of uh, containing them in, in false hive structures. Um, we've brought them from Europe, tamed them, we moved them around our orchards. Um, these unnatural um, numbers, unnatural aggregations kind of uh, prevent natural evolution from happening, kind of prevent the survival of the fitter, if you will. So we have a lot of very same honeybees individuals out there and uh, they don't have natural resistance to some pathogens, some new pathogens that are coming on. Um, so many hives are under stress from existing pathogens. And of course, you can't underplay the importance of a lot of the neurotoxins that farmers use to uh, kill um, species, pest species on their crops. And so the, uh, it turns out that the honeybee uh, is very likely susceptible to some of those uh, toxins that farmers use to control the pest load on their crops. We have plenty of num native bumblebees, and you can see why bees are so expert at being pollinators, because they are covered in hairs. 
and that hair is just what that pollen clings to, allows that pollen to move from one flower to the other as long as the bee visits the same species over and over. And luckily, many insects, many bees, um, most nectivorous species, um, they have a special kind of memory. They can remember the logo of their favorite place to eat. Compare it to yourself driving down the freeway and you're in a state you've never been before or a town you've never been before and you're hungry and you're looking for some food. If you see the golden arches, you know exactly what you're gonna get from the golden arches. Like it or not, you might decide to avoid it because you know what they have and you want to look for a different logo, uh, but bees can imprint, some are born with the impression of what logo they're looking for. Sometimes it's learned. Um, sometimes a bee might land on a flower that's particularly yummy and it's gonna remember what that flower looks like. And that is how the pollen from the same species can get from one plant to another plant for uh, outcrossing. And here is a passion flower showing us just how it puts its flower together to ensure that its pollen is rubbed right on the back of this bumblebee. These long structures here uh, bear the pollen on their, well, in, once they've turned upside down, on their undersides. And it's literally brushing off the pollen onto the back of this bumblebee. Um, the stigmas, the, the section in the middle that collect the pollen, they bend down on the second day of the flowers open and so that they can pick the pollen up off a bee that has visited a separate flower. So all these things have evolved all these wonderful systems together. All right, we need to hurry on because we've got to get through the ants. Love the ants. These are harvester ants. Um, these are vegetarian ants. They, they harvest uh, grass seeds. They make these very clean uh, subterranean colonies. They have very, very scary giant, what are called guards, but they're not actually guards, they're grinders. They have big heads with big muscles and they use their mandibles to grind the grass seed into flour that they feed their young. You might recognize an anthill. Uh, this one belongs to the cone ants. They have a cone on their thorax and they also make kind of a, uh, a volcano looking nest. Again, most of the nest is subterranean with the queen and the drones. Uh, once a year, many, most ant species send up their alates, their flying members to leave the colony and start a new one somewhere else. So um, these are hymenopterans. They do have the membranous wings, just not necessarily year round. Can't not mention the imported red fire ants. They make this very messy mound overnight, uh, no real structure to it, um, and talk about defending their colony. These things, they were imported from South America. They rush out and they completely envelop anything that is messing with their mound, their hive, their colony. Um, the University of Florida has tested all the folk remedies uh, from uh, pouring gasoline on a fire ant mound and setting fire to it, not recommended. Uh, putting cornmeal on a fire ant mound and expecting that to work, not recommended. Uh, boiling water, not recommended. Um, only over-the-counter products that are labeled to control imported red fire ants work to control imported red fire ants. Anything else could put you or your family members at risk. So, or just a waste of time and money. All right, I promise you butterflies, we'll do some butterflies. We'll do some butterflies and their host plants. How about that? I bet you already know a whole lot of these. I bet you do. Uh, we'll start with the sulfurs. They're called sulfurs because there is an element called sulfur. You might've heard of sulfur or sulfurous. Guess what color that element is? pale yellow. Uh, sulfurs tend to feed on a legume called a sickle pod, a member of the senna. Uh, the senna has yellow flowers. And if the caterpillar with these very broad, I mean, uh, bold black stripes on a yellow background, if the caterpillars feed on the yellow flowers, the caterpillar turns yellow. 
guess what color the caterpillar turns if it feeds on the green leaves? Again, you can talk out loud because you're by yourself. Right, green. Our state butterfly, the zebra long wing. Um, zebra because of the black and white patterning, long wing because it has uh, these very horizontally held uh, longer than broad wings. Here it is feeding on a fire bush. Uh, the larva of the zebra long wing um, is not as spiky as it looks, but that spiky look is a defense. Do not touch me. Do not like to be touched. I'm covered in spikes, even though their spikes are technically very, very soft. It's an illusion. And they feed on the same, uh, they, their larval host plant is the same as the Gulf fritillary. And this is a great slide of the Gulf fritillary. You know the fritillaries, the bright orange with the distinctive, very, very silvery underside. This is great. You can see the large eyes that this butterfly is going to look for its motif, its logo, so it can visit the same flower to get the same treat. You can see the long club-like antenna of the butterflies, the proboscis siphoning nectar out from the bottom of these tiny little tubular flowers. But what else you can see in this slide is how the butterfly is just kind of tiptoeing around this group of tiny little flowers. It's not picking up pollen really at all. Butterflies are really not very good pollinators, to be honest. I mean, studies have shown that they're actually quite bad. Um, they sure do like their nectar, uh, but in the scheme of things, the beetles, the ants, the love bugs, the bumblebees, our native bees, all much better than the butterflies. The butterflies could almost be considered nectar thieves. Um, but the zebra longwing and the gulf fritillary the larval food plant is the passion vine. So to, and again, these are fake. These are fake news, folks. These are not going to sting you. They're very, very soft. We don't recommend petting them, um, but they're not full of scary venom. The white peacock, so named because it has quite a few eye spots. We met some of the eye spots with the larger moths. Uh, this is peacock because it has all these uh, eye spots. They're kind of seasonal. They kind of come and go throughout the year. Sometimes you'll see a bunch of them and then kind of miss them for a couple months and then they come back. Uh, their larval food plant, um, also quite a good nectar plant for attracting other species of butterfly to your yard or garden, is frog fruit or fog fruit. Uh, this is a native, low-growing, excellent ground cover. Uh, this is one of the things that true green would uh, target as a weed species in your lawn. Uh, but if you like butterflies, it's something um, to tell True Green to take a hike and encourage uh, this to um, move in and even take over if it wants to. Uh, you can see that it's related to uh, lantana, uh, but frog fruit is not an invasive species. It's a nice evergreen ground, native ground cover. Everybody knows this one. Say it out loud. Yes, it's the Viceroy, the Florida Viceroy. Um, now you might have said monarch, um, and of course it does look very much like a monarch, but it's got this extra line in the hind wing, right there, missing in the monarchs. Also in Florida, the Viceroys tend to be a much darker brick orange, um, but they still do a really good job of looking like a monarch. And you might know, you might think you know why they want to look like a monarch. The Viceroy feeds on willow. Salix is the genus of willow. And you might have heard of salicylic acid. That's aspirin. Have you ever bitten down on an aspirin? It's really, really bitter. Uh, the larva, the caterpillar of the Viceroy, which looks like um, bird poop, Star Wars, bird poop, I don't know. Um, they can aggregate that salicylic acid and make themselves unpalatable to predators. So if a bird accidentally chomped down on one of these, it wouldn't do it again. The same chemical is in the body of the adult viceroy. So if a bird bites down on a viceroy, it's not gonna do it again. Yuck. 
The monarch here, you can see, does not have that line, but it also is orange with the black and white spots. And the queen, also orange with the black and white spots. These three species of butterflies, the queen, the monarch, which are related to each other, and the viceroy, which is not, they've evolved this similar coloration to protect each, well, to protect themselves, their own genes, but the fact that they look so much like each other protects each other. So a bird that chomps down on a viceroy probably wouldn't chomp down on a monarch or a queen because they learned their lesson on the viceroy. They can't really tell the difference and so forth. If a bird chomps down on a monarch, it's gonna leave the viceroy and the queen alone. The viceroy, of course, concentrating salicylic acid in its body tissues and the queens and the monarchs concentrating the, uh, the, the deadly toxin that milkweed tries desperately to produce to keep from being predated upon because you know plants can't get up and leave. All they can do is sit there and make uh, poisons to try and keep from being eaten. But uh, monarchs and queens, they're immune to that poison and too bad milkweed, we're gonna eat every single leaf you create. Thankfully, it doesn't kill the plant. Most milkweeds can rebound. There's a group of butterflies known as the swallowtails. Sorry, I'm going a little bit over and I won't go too, I won't speed too fast. Uh, the zebra, uh, sorry, the swallowtails, so named because there's a bird called a swallow that has this very distinctive pair of extended feathers that it uh, drags behind it when it's flying. The zebra swallowtail, this one you won't see in town. You'll only see the species at our preserves because the food plant for the zebra swallowtail, so named for these bold black and white stripes, and a very, very long uh, swallowtail extension of the hind wing. The food plant for the zebra swallowtail is the pawpaw plant. And arguably pawpaw plants are not pretty. They were not left behind when Pinellas was developed as a, as a potential you know, landscape plant. Um, they're used, they look, I mean, arguably they look really, really, really bad at the kind of starting in the middle of summer uh, because the zebra swallowtails have had Adam. Uh, they do have pretty flowers early in the spring and they do smell kind of like rotten bananas. Um, but this is the larval host plant for the zebra swallowtail. So come to Brooker, go to Whedon uh, and look for the zebra swallowtails. They're very, very powerful flyers. You can't mistake them from that black and white, but they don't usually sit still for photography. The tiger swallowtail, so named for its yellow and black coloration like tiger stripes, um, their larval food is trees. And thankfully we've got plenty of those, they're not very picky. Um, so the zebra, the tiger, we're walking around the staff here at Brooker and we holler out zebra, just zebra, or we holler out tiger if we see one of these species and we've had visitors kind of look at us like, you know you really didn't see a tiger. Um, moving on. The gold rim is one of our black swallowtails. I am really not very good at telling the black swallowtails apart, um, but I can tell a polydamus or a gold rim because it has the single unbroken line of gold around the rim of the forewings and the hind wings. Its larval food is pipevine, but the pipe fine swallowtail and the gold rim. They're known to feed on pipe vine, but I realized we don't have native pipe vine in Pinellas County. So we do have these butterflies. What are they feeding on? Well, I did a little research and they also feed on the various morning glories. Um, we have several native morning glories in the genus Ipomea and Distamake to name a couple. Um, so that's how we can have these butterflies in the absence of native pipe vine. A lot of people plant pipe vine in their gardens, non-native pipe vine to attract the pipe vine swallowtails to lay their eggs on that. The giant swallowtail, I like to call a flying handkerchief. This is aptly named. Again, it's about as big as a grown-up's hand, maybe a grown-up's hand and a half a grown-up's hand. Um, very strong bar that traverses the four wings and there's even coloration 
in the tips of those swallowtails themselves. Now this one, the caterpillar, is a really good bird poop mimic. I mean, that is a good job right there. I don't think any self-respecting bird would want to chomp down on that. Uh, their larval food include various members of the citrus family. Uh, we have uh, wild lime is one of the native uh, members of the citrus family, the rutaceae. Spice bush swallowtail, I mentioned the pipe vine swallowtail. This is the one that I get the pipe vine swallowtail mixed up. Um, apparently you can tell them apart. It can be done, I can't do it. So I just say, oh, there goes one of those nice black swallowtails. But this is a picture of a spice bush swallowtail. Uh, nice silvery blue patches on the hind wings, but I can't remember that. So I just call it a black swallowtail. Um, we don't have spice bush in Pinellas County, but we do have red bay. And red bay is a larval food plant for the spice bush swallowtail. I'm going to end up with this group. It's my co-host Julia's favorite group. Uh, and thank you, Julia, for doing, so, doing such a wonderful job being a co-host this afternoon. Uh, these are the various, this group called the gossamer winged butterflies or the hair streaks. I think I like gossamer winged better than hair streak. Um, there are various different species. This one's called the white M. And if you look closely, you can see, look, it's a white M right there on the hind wing. This is the gray hair streak. You can see the similarities in the species, but there's no M on the gray. This is the red banded hair streak with a, guess what, red band. But you'll also notice these funny little appendages that stick out on their hind wings. Those are fake antenna. And when the hair streaks are at rest, they kind of rub their hind wings together and they move those little fake antenna with the illusion that that would be the head of the butterfly so that if a bird or any other predator were to fly in, they're much more likely to attack the head of their prey species because that would dispatch that prey species immediately. So a bird could fly in and grab the hind wing of one of these species of hair streak. Here's the hind end. See, it even fooled me. Here's the back end. Um, but it wouldn't dispatch the individual. It would just fly off with a dusty mouthful of hind wing. And the, um, the animal can survive that. And here's one called the great purple hair streak who that very thing happened to. This is one we saw here at Brooker feeding on, um, not a coronavirus, it's, what is this? It's button bush. Um, and it has lost its fake antenna. So you only get to use the trick once, uh, but it worked. It saved the great purple hair streak's life because the bird mistook the fake antennas for the reals. Okay, so the, Purple hair streak lost its butt. I kind of feel like I've lost mine. It's time to wrap up. That was a lot of information I know. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. This will be recorded. I will provide the recording of this presentation. Uh, once it's posted to our YouTube page, we're gonna provide closed captioning um, for everyone who might need that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. Really appreciate it. We hope you'll join us for some more of our webinars in the Florida Supernature series. We have Life of Lichen next week, Botanical Science for Beginners the week after. You can sign up for both at this URL, this bit.ly uh, stroke FL Supernature. Most of our information is posted daily uh, on our Facebook page, Brooker Creek Environmental Education Center. I will leave this slide up for just a second. You can take down my email address if you have any questions, comments, complaints, concerns, or ways that we can make our presentations better please let us know. So thank you again for your attention and have a great afternoon.